This is Randall Smith, and you are listening to my lecture on postmodern design, prepared for my Designer 2600 class, The History of Graphic Design, at the University of Utah, Spring 2020. The lecture is based broadly on Chapter 20, Postmodern Design, from the book Meg's History of Graphic Design by Philip Meggs and Alston Purvis. So by the late 1970s, many designers believed that the modern aesthetic was simply no longer relevant to the information age. The term postmodernism was used by many disciplines, but particularly by designers and architects, both of whom were breaking away from the international style that was so common since the Bauhaus. Postmodernist designers embraced lots of things, decorative solutions, historical references, vernacular design, all things that were not remotely considered by a Swiss or international style designer. There's a lot of combination of influences that created a very eclectic era of graphic design. The international style for architecture has similar characteristics as the international typographic style for graphic designers. We have looked at some boxy modernist buildings, steel, glass, form follows function, but this is not one of them. 1982, an architect made a dramatic shift away from the international style in a public building in Portland, Oregon. This is the work of Michael Graves. It doesn't look like a modernist international style at all. Michael Graves might be more known now for product design than architecture. For a number of years, he had a close association with, with Target and was designing products for them. Michael Graves is one of the first architects to re rebel against the purest modern aesthetic. Metropolis Magazine, in its 25th anniversary issue about 10 years ago, defined this building as one of the 15 most defining moments in design of the past quarter century. The building has a lot of decorative and historical references. Some suggest that postmodernism was an inevitable reaction, considering the international style for both architecture and graphic design had become so completely refined. Postmodern designers are more subjective. They're more personal. They do something simply because it, it feels right, rather than to fulfill a rational communication function. The designer almost becomes an artist performing before an audience. Graphic design was never dominated by the international style to the same degree that it was in architecture, and graphic design doesn't always have parallel historical categories with architecture, but there are clear references between the two disciplines. Postmodern graphic design can be loosely categorized into several major directions. We're going to look at representatives from each of these four different postmodern directions. Number one, the early Swiss breakoffs from the international typographic style, what we might call early Swiss postmodern. Number two, new wave typography coming from Basel through the teaching of Wolfgang Weingart. And three, early 80s exuberant mannerisms found in Memphis and the San Francisco schools. And then lastly, retro and vernacular design. We should note that categorizing contemporary designers, some of whom are still practicing, is a bit risky. Most artists, whether they're art or music or otherwise, disdain a bit being put into a box. It's human nature to do so, I think. It does help us organize and understand some of these 
designers have long careers and people change. Just so happens that at the moment in their career that we're talking about them, it's convenient, in fact, to categorize them in this fashion, whether they like it or not. But before we do that, we need to comment a bit on supermannerism and super graphics. These are terms used to describe the trends in the 60s of the decoration of architecture with bold geometric shapes in bright colors, giant Helvetica letters, and huge pictographs. Vibrant primary colors and these sans serif letter forms, arcs, slashing diagonals all form a strong counterpoint to the architectural structure as found in brilliant sunlighted stairwells. I look at my career and I can see some of these same trends, my own portfolio. I remember in the late seventies, a local interior designer hired me to design some huge pictographic symbols for the local company, Mount Olympus Springwater in their interior offices. I just designed them. I, I hired a billboard painter to paint them on the wall. I do, in fact, remember talking my younger brothers into allowing me to paint their initials on their bedroom wall in big four-foot-high Helvetica letters about 1973. That might even be me in the mirror, I don't know. So Robert Venturi is the most well-known supermannerist architect and became one of the major architectural figures of the 20th century and a critic of the strict allegiance to form following function, clearly placing him in the postmodern category. Venturi is known for coining the term, less is a bore, a postmodern antidote to the Mies van der Rohe statement, less is more. Venturi incorporated a lot of odd materials, graphic and commercial elements into his vocabulary even worked for a period of time with the postmodern Memphis group, which we'll be talking about in a few minutes. When I was at the Museum of Modern Art a couple of years ago, several panels from this best storefront were on display in the museum. Venturi suggested that designers could learn from the signs and architecture of strip malls in Las Vegas, perhaps the least likely subject that you'd expect for a serious design research project. Venturi said that vernacular design can be beautiful. Even the marquees and signs of advertising for cheap motels or gambling halls. He advocated that you incorporate these commercial graphics and technologies and materials into architectural practice. So we're going to look at the work of uh, a couple of designers that we spoke about two weeks ago, Siegfried Odermott and Rosemary Tissy. These are some of the first to break away from the strict purism of the international typographic style. Here's a poster Rosemary Tissy did for a summer theater group, 1981. Some of these breaks away from the purism of the international typographic style might be a little subtle, uh, but some of the things in this particular poster uh, that is noteworthy, these little strips of type, um, something that you see reoccurring in their work a number of times, probably not what a strict Swiss designer might do. And Rosemary Tissy is using Gill Sands instead of Helvetica or Universe. Just kind of humanizing the hard line of the Swiss style. Here's another poster of Tissy's. This is a promotion for a typesetting company, 1983. You don't have that strong grid. There are Roman type styles. 
but it still looks kind of Swissy in style. This is a small folder for a printer, 1981. And here's the work of her partner, Siegfried Odermatt. And you can see Odermatt's use of uh, the company logo. This is for uh, Union, is the brand name. They make wall safes. This is 1968. But the way he overlapped and cropped the Union logo is, uh, is, is, is definitely different for a international style designer. Another Odermont for exhibition poster, 1982. Again, you see use of that little uh, word word strips, almost a typographic collage. Gives it a bit of a spontaneity, perhaps. And it looks like it's used in uh, Futura. So another Swiss designer who eventually moves to Philadelphia is uh, Steph Giesbühler, G-E-I-S-B-U-H-L-A-R. He eventually becomes a partner with Shemayoff and Giesmar, the firm that we've mentioned previously. This is one of five posters that Giesbühler used as decorative wall displays for his client, Blazer, a travel services company. The graphics kind of suggest movement and travel in a kind of complex solution. The repetition of these typographic forms was very popular. I remember doing it myself. So this is the first category of postmodernism this early Swiss postmodern, which is just design that modified Swiss design and made it quite, quite a bit less rigid than it had been before. But the second category of postmodern design we refer to as new wave typography. This began in Basel, Switzerland and spread from there throughout the world starting with Wolfgang Weingart. Weingart studied under Emil Ruder, who we've talked about, and in fact took Ruder's place on the faculty at the Basel School in 1968. And Weingart began to teach and question the topography of absolute order and cleanness. He believed that the international typographic style had, in fact, become so refined that it had reached an anemic phase. Weingart questioned the academics of typography that suggested everything had to be neat and orderly. He said, why must paragraphs be always indicated with an indent? Why can't you change the weight right in the middle of a word? Why can't you use wide ladder spacing or reverse it out of a rectangle? We'll be talking a lot about Weingart's American students, which includes April Dryman and Dan Friedman and Willie Coons, because it was they who started to popularize Weingart's postmodern style in the United States. But all of the styles that was used by those American students of his that became popular at the time had been explored by Weingart in, in decades uh, previously in the 60s and 70s. Of course, Weingart, Weingart is not one to stand still, and he explored new directions following the new typography. These are from the latter part of his career where Weingart embraced collage as a medium of expression. He enlarged halftone dots and moray patterns 
into his postmodern expression. This is a exhibition poster, 1983. And another exhibition poster on calligraphy, black and white. So Weingart, an influential teacher because one of his students and others came to the United States following their education with Weingart. This is Dan Friedman, one of those. He became an early representative of this postmodern movement in both his graphic design, his furniture, and his sculpture. And parts of his career definitely fit into this new wave typography category. Friedman also became an instructor at Yale, where he taught students to explore typography in a way that forced students to think a bit more expansively about how type can be more expressive within the constraints of just one typeface. Very similar to typography assignments that you may have had or will get, and similar to ones that I have given when I taught the same subject. This is Friedman's work for a, uh, a fashion house Bonwit Teller. This is their gift packaging, 1977. Interesting contrast of the linear elements of the design with these casual brush strokes, uh, which you see reoccurring in Friedman's work and others' work. In fact, it becomes a bit of a, a hallmark of the era. You can see here again, uh, but a totally different target market. This is, instead of high fashion, this is fast food. But it still has some of those new wave elements in it. This is 1978, Chicken Little. This is the logo and stationery for uh, a New York fashion designer. And you can see that the red elements here are not simply just an identifying mark, but they also help in the pronunciation of what might be a difficult name. Friedman worked for the large identity firm Anspuk Grossman in Portugal, where Friedman designed the Citicorp corporate identity in 1975. This is the same company that was redesigned by Paul Scheer Pentagram just more recently. Friedman says he looks back on this with uh, a bit of both pride and cynicism, his work for these large corporate identity projects. You can tell just by looking at his photos that he's not much of a corporate-looking individual. He suggests that these kinds of identities reflect a preoccupation with things that look more than what they really are. They become a bit predictable, indistinguishable, and it is, in fact, a valid criticism of a lot of corporate design. Corporate design tends to be conservative. They're concerned about doing anything too unusual or too different. In fact, I could be pointing the finger at my own firm because that's exactly the kind of work that, that we do. But Friedman's work, even for Citibank, here is not totally corporate. I noted the, the NK ligature for Citibank. And even the placement of the City Citibank logo in the far upper right corner of this business card is a bit a bit unusual. This is cool. This is a logo for a furniture maker, Paul Luddick, in 1990. I love it. It looks just like little 
pieces of furniture. Apparently, Dan Friedman's home is in a constant state of change. This is a 1986, and this is just two years later, 1988. So another of Weingart's students uh, in Basel was April Griman, who moves to Los Angeles and starts a studio. I don't know why she's bald in this picture, but she's, she's an interesting individual. At the early stage of Griman's career, she really falls into this new wave typography camp introducing a sense of depth to the typographic page by overlapping forms, diagonal lines, floating forms with drop shadows. It's a bit of a cliche, drop shadows, but, but not so much so in, in 1979. Here's the identity and the dinnerware created for a, a club in Los Angeles, uh, China Club, 1979. Graman really enlarged upon the Basel thinking, particularly in her use of color and photography. She had a strong collaboration with a photographer named Jamie Odgers, and together with him, they moved photographic illustration into a whole new realm, spatially in particular, and difficult to do in 79 before the advent of Photoshop. In this poster for the Los Angeles County Museum of Art in 1981, she had used spray paint and photographed it and type pasted it up in a conventional manner that was prepared for printing at the time. Typical new wave typography, you see that mix of serif and sans serif with wide letter spacing. This poster for the Pacific Design Center in 83 came with its own 3D glasses, which uh, jumped their imagery right off, the, right off the poster. So new wave typography and postmodernism in general really sent shockwaves through the design establishment because it was challenging the order and clarity of design, particularly corporate design, we're going to come back to April Grime in the next chapter when we talk about the digital revolution. Here's three slides of the Swiss-born and educated designer Willie Kuhns. Kuhns accepted a one-year appointment to teach typography at the Basel School of Design while Weingart was on sabbatical. And after Kuhn's moves to New York, he also helped introduce new wave typography in the United States. He's been producing a poster series for Columbia University Architecture Department for 13 years from 1985 to 93. It's kind of a rare example of a graphic designer pursuing a project in experimental typography over an extended period of time. And even within this narrowly defined parameters of new wave typography, his posters have in fact changed and expanded over that decade. Here's another one in that typographic workshop, 1974. In this exhibition poster designed by Kuhns in 78, uh, may not look like it to you, but this is a very, very influential piece. Just the simplicity of the photographer's name set in two lines, one in a lighter weight type and one in a bolder weight type. And then the word vicissitude set on an angle over the top of the photo, part of it in a bolder face type. I mean, this is unusual stuff in 78. And became very influential. New technologies of desktop 
publishing helped define much of the new wave typography. In the early days of desktop publishing, it still required the services of a service bureau to output your digital files before turning it over to a printer. And these geometric charts and isometric patterns were typical of the capabilities of this new technology and often explored by designers at the time. This is 1988. Both this image. So another direction in the postmodern movement, the third that we've talked about, developed in the late 70s and early 80s from the architecture and product designers in Milan, Italy, and the graphic designers in San Francisco. And these two share some stylistic similarities, even though they were named and located far apart. The author calls this the early 80s exuberant mannerisms. The Italian group of architects and designers were called Memphis. Apparently a night of drinking and listening to Bob Dylan's Stuck Inside of Mobile with the Memphis Blues again gave the group its name even though they're located in Italy. So the Memphis group featured bold geometric forms, bright colors, organic patterns, Roman columns and pediments. Obviously, this does not look like form following function. In fact, form becomes the reason for the design to even exist. Incidentally, this is by a designer that moves to Utah in the later part of his career working in this Memphis style. His name is Milo Boffman. This is an etagere and sofa. But the most important Memphis designer was Ettor Sotsas. And you may recall Sotsas was the one that designed the Olivetti Valentine typewriter that we have seen previously and in Milton Glaser's poster. Sotsoff's created furniture that seems to be almost mocking the certainties of the modernist aesthetic, deliberately undermining the idea of order and consistency. This is 1984. Here's a lamp designed by Sotsas in 81. So these decorative color patterns and wild geometric forms were very experimental, but they did influence graphic design. I remember, in fact, uh, a restaurant located very close to my office. It was an Italian restaurant, and uh, the designer at the time was Ted Nagata, who uh, indicated that when he designed the logo for Bati, this restaurant on Pierpont Avenue in downtown Salt Lake, he did some research and was influenced by the Memphis movement. And in fact, you could see it in the logo for Bati. Part of this same subcategory of postmodern together with Memphis, is the San Francisco style. Both Memphis and San Francisco styles share some of the same attitude, even though Memphis was primarily product design and San Francisco was primarily graphic design. This is the poster for California Public Radio, graphically depicting the nature of radio, spoken and listening, it's a poster designed by Michael Vanderbile in 1979. And I want you to be aware of the graphics of it and think about the Memphis furniture that we've just been looking at. 
This is Michael Vanderbile's promotional poster for a paper company, Simpson Paper. It was really a rather large folding brochure. And you might note that the subject matter is, in fact, Memphis, the Italian design studio we just spoke about. In between the mixed fonts and in smaller letters, you see the word Memphis. It even includes the furniture piece by Sotsas that we just saw. This is 1985. So this is another in that Simpson paper promotion series. 1985 uh, features the postmodern work of Michael Graves that we started our lecture with tonight. In fact, it's his name that is in smaller letters across the bottom. Here's a close-up detail of the left side of the brochure showing the finished building and the rendering of the photo that we showed you. This is all the work of Michael Vanderbile from San Francisco. This is Vanderbile's Postmodern architectural poster, 1984. Here you've got this postmodern building sticking out its tongue at the very modern glass box building, obviously in the international style. Vanderbile here is taking advantage of the obvious differences between modernism and postmodernism. Vanderbile's work here for a furniture company in 1985, HBF. Those freely drawn strokes of color in California pastels. Kind of combining postmodern style with typographic layouts that are more Swiss style in origin. Michael Vanderbil was in Salt Lake many years ago speaking at an AIGA event, and he told a story of how he ended up designing furniture. He said that he was often critical of the furniture design that he was asked to promote in his brochures and advertising that he did for his client, when one day the president of the furniture company said, well, if you're so smart, why don't you design some furniture? So he decided to. In fact, if you Google his name, Michael Vanderbile, you'll see many more links about his furniture than you will about his graphic design. He said that he decided with his wife that if they made any money from furniture, that they would put that into a separate account, perhaps saving for their children's college education. He said that he has, in fact, much more money in that account than he does the graphic design account. This is a current piece of furniture designed for that same company as that 1985 brochure that we saw in the previous slide. There's a brochure for Another uh, a photographer uh, in 1995 by Michael Vanderbil. Vanderbil is one of the four Michaels from San Francisco. Besides Michael Vanderbil, there was Michael Cronin, Michael Mannering, and Michael Mabry. Michael Mabry, in fact, is a graduate from the University of Utah. All of those Michaels seem to raise graphic design to new heights in their work from San Francisco all at about the same time. Michael Mabry, in fact, spoke here at the University of Utah not too long ago, talked about his graduation from our school.
So this poster, designed by Paula Shearer in 1979 for CBS Records, really introduced young American designers to the forgotten design languages of the past. She kind of unlocked floodgates for designers to pilfer historical artifacts, and it became known as retro design. And for a generation of designers and consumers who had become disconnected from the past, retro turns out to be rather fresh. Paul Shear was an art director at CBS Records from 1975 to 82. And in the late 70s, the record industry was doing poorly. She said that she no longer had money to hire illustrators and photographers. And right about the same time, Russian constructivists was being revisited in books and exhibits. And Cher has had a long interest in old graphic styles and collected them. But this poster that she designed for CBS Records in 79 was really a mix. The type is wood type styles from the 1800s. She added a border, which is unlike the Russian constructivist, but she did put it on an angle, which is typical, as well as the red and black colorway. This poster spells out the word best in big black letters because it was the best of jazz poster. But there's a lot of overprints, surprints, and knockouts. It's really a hybrid of two different historical forms that feels contemporary and yet familiar all at the same time. So retro together with the vernacular design, is this fourth and final subcategory of postmodern design that we're talking about. And this retro really came out of a, a new awareness of graphic design history. Retro paraphrases modern design from the decades between the two world wars, rarely anything earlier than that. Polisher turned to typography solutions instead of illustrative solutions because, she said, she was not very good at drawing. This is a promotional booklet of different typographic ideas that were paraphrasing Russian constructivism and futurism and Dada that she freely combined and reinvented when she was a partner with Ted Koppel. The brochure or booklet was called Great Beginnings from 1984. I think we've seen this before. We might comment again that effectively interpreting historical si styles can be harder than it looks Reinterpreting the past can range from the ethical, which might be just inspiration or influence or parody, to the questionable imitation or plagiarism. This is that famous Herbert Matter poster from the 1930s that was unabashedly parodied by Cher for Swatch watches and Swatch is, of course, a Swiss watch manufacturer. This is all before Polisher joined Pentagram. This is 1985. Retro design was very popular in book jacket design. This is the work of Louise Fili, F-I-L-I, -I, book cover for The Lover for Pantheon Books, 1983. Louise Feely worked for Herb Ballen, but started with Pantheon Books in 83. She then started her own studio in 1989, and today designs work mostly for food and restaurants, menus and packaging and the like. Feely takes 
frequent trips to Italy. And there she discovered things that were very influential in her typographic development. These are some signs that she shot in Italy. This is another one. Picking up on these kind of kinky, unusual, decorative, vernacular typefaces, most of which had really fallen out of any kind of popularity. But she likes to incorporate these into her book jackets and her restaurants and her packaging projects. Most of the time, she had to hand draw the letter forms because they were not typefaces that were available digitally. All of these, in fact, are photographs uh, from a book. This is uh, the cover to the book Grafica della Strada, The Signs of Italy, 2014. She published it. Uh, of course, she designed the cover to the book in a very similar style to the photographs that were inside. This is some of her product design for product. In fact, she designed these uh, Perfecto pencils in 2014. Very 1930s classic script. You can buy these for 11 bucks at Amazon, which in fact I, I did for Christmas present for uh, one of our associates at the office. Louise Philly is married, in fact, to Stephen Huller, the graphic design author. Another designer working in Book jacket design was Karen Goldberg. Karen Goldberg had worked with Lou Dorfman at CBS and had worked with Paula Shear at CBS Records. Karen Goldberg introduced a lot of retro influences into her book covers. This is a 1986 edition of uh, James Joyce's Ulysses. And in fact, it placed her in the midst of the 1980s fight over historic appropriation. Here's uh, the poster that Karen Goldberg was reinterpreting. It's a Paul Renner poster from the 1920s, which we saw once before. But Karen Bo Goldberg found herself praised by the author of our book, Philip Meggs, who in a 1989 essay titled The Women Who Saved New York Meg said that he admired her for using historical styles in a contemporary design. On the other hand, Tibor Kalman vilified her for practicing what he called jive modernism in a 1991 print magazine essay that was titled Good History, Bad History. Here's another of Karen Goldberg's uh, work on a book cover called, titled The Sonnets of Orpheus, 1987. And you will note some very close similarities between the sans serif lettering here contained inside this black rectangle and the work of the Vienna workshops that we saw talking about that same Vienna time frame. Another book cover, cover by Karen Goldberg. And yet another Sinatra. This song is you. Here's a book cover for notebooks of... Um, uh, I can't pronounce it, but it's designed by Daniel Pelevin in 1985. And the lettering here by Pelevin is inspired by Gustav Klimt poster from the Vienna Secession. Here's 
There's another book cover by Daniel Pelevin, Hoover's Guide to the Top Southern California Companies. It's designed in 1996, but you can see it's very clearly uh, retro in style, including a lot of symbolic iconography. So closely associated with retro design is vernacular design. But more common than roadside signs would be vernacular design found in graphic junk, like junk art on matchbook covers or baseball cards or cheap clip art style illustrations as found in phone books. Graphic treasure hunters have visited flea markets looking for these commonplace things and use them in their work. This is a product design by Charles Spencer Anderson while he is working at Duffy Design Group. And these kinds of designs, in this case by uh, Midwestern designers, this Duffy Design Group, are taking these everyday vernacular images and turning them into a postmodern aesthetic. Charles Spencer Anderson created a large body of work that was based on these vintage icons and cultural kitsch from another time. Pushpin Studio used similar references some decades before. But both Anderson and Duffy added kind of an 80s vibrancy to their color and their paper. Duffy said he thinks graphic time travel is a bit cynical and manipulative. He believes it's done because marketers want to make their products attractive. I have my doubts about Charles Spencer Anderson's cynicism. He seems rather complicit in these products that he designed for pasta sauce, or in this case for pocket tag for Ralph Lauren. This is a nostalgic trademark that Charles Spencer Anderson did at Duffy Design Group using this line technique that just really looks like old newspaper spot illustrations from the 30s and 40s. It was used together with others in a self-promotion piece that the Duffy Design Group did for French Paper Company. The partners split up in 1989. Charles Spinner Anderson went on his own started his own company. But Anderson is still into the vernacular of the 40s and 50s. He created this library of clip art that he's now developed. Really relying on the history of commercial printing to revitalize design in this era. Here's Charles Spencer Anderson designing some watch and packaging. A poster for a speaking engagement of Charles Spencer Anderson at the AIGA in Los Angeles in 95. Charles Spencer Anderson spoke here at the uh, local chapter, the AIGA. In fact, he handed out this poster that he did for Hatch Showprint. 
This poster is hanging at our downtown office. In 1986, a chef named Florent Morlet opened an inexpensive French restaurant in New York City in the rather unfashionable meatpacking district. The chef had no money, and so he just rented a funky old luncheonette that had recently gone out of business. He wanted to remain unpretentious while still appealing to an upscale target market. He had to have the basics that any business would need, a menu, signs, and he hired a company called M and Company, M and Company, a New York City design firm that was known for doing very experimental work. The creative director at M and Company was Tibor Kalman, T-I-B-O-R, Kalman, K-A-L-M-A-N, Coleman suggested that Florent just keep all of the fixtures and the furniture and the utensils and the sign that the previous greasy spoon had left behind. Coleman said, just let the restaurant design itself. Coleman decided that to be consistent, the menu should look like an untrained printer had created it. They intended to use a place that did this kind of work, typical Greek coffee shops, etc. But it didn't work out because, he said, the printer kept trying to imitate designed things. It took two months to design what they wanted. If we weren't trained as designers, it wouldn't have taken us so long, said Kalman. The difference between something really wonderful and really horrible is very close, Kalman claimed. I think it's a serious omission in our textbook, the work of Tibor Kalman of New York City's M and Company, who in the earlier part of his career frequently used vernacular designs in his work. This is a postcard printed on crude paperboard. Coleman used it to illustrate the idea of the restaurant through just pictographs lifted straight from the yellow pages of a Manhattan phone book. Coleman said, Our vocabulary was based on dumb, really obvious, generic images used in most commercial advertising. But the goal here was not nostalgia. Coleman insisted that the difference between nostalgic kitsch and appropriation is how the finished product is filtered through the designer. He said nuance is the key. Advertising, created by M & Company, employed quirky allusions and images Hopefully readers recognize this as a ad for a restaurant as opposed to a butcher or something else. This likewise was a newspaper ad. In fact, M and Company created a different ad every week. This is another ad, though it's clearly just a photo of one of those cheesy signboards, which in fact was found left over from the grocery spoon days of the restaurant. This type of design, particularly in the fashion-oriented restaurant business, is really asking the reader to engage in the joke. Are you hip enough to realize that we are deliberately undesigning this? Probably many would not get the joke and assume, well, bad design, bad restaurant. But then they wouldn't be the kind of diner we want at our restaurant, would they? For seven years, M & Company bartered design services for food, 
and the whole office ate lunch there four days a week. M and Company's work was a pioneering effort in using vernacular form. I went to dinner there myself with my family about nine or ten years ago, and we picked up reprints of all of these famous M and Company ads. These ads were also noted in Metropolis Magazine's 25th anniversary issue and defined the restaurant and the promotions as one of the 15 most defining moments in design of the past quarter century. In the Museum of Modern Art's permanent collection is the 10-1-4 watch, designed by M&Company in 1983. Their success at this watch seemed to launch a lot of other designers designing watches at different firms across the nation. Just three random hours from which to navigate the day. I've got one of these watches. I love it. In fact, I remember one day sitting next to an individual who I didn't know who kept glancing down at my watch and Finally, he said to me, 10-1-4, what happened to all the other numbers? At M and Company, downtime in the studio was apparently watch design time. They mixed conservative design and outrageous concepts that subverted typical timekeeping conventions. Really, it's a limitless territory to explore an easy route for graphic designers to get into product design. I bought mine at the Museum of Modern Art, but you can also do it online. The celebrated Italian photographer Oliviero Toscanini approached T. Barra Kalman at M & Company to design a magazine for the Italian clothing manufacturer Benetton. A condition of Tibor's acceptance was that he would also be the editor-in-chief. He said, I knew it would be the best job I'd ever get. The first issue provoked a lot of media attention and criticism. It was highly censored picture of a very real, gooey, bloody newborn baby with the umbilical cord still attached. Toscanini's version of the company's tagline, United Colors, was seen as a metaphor for the races of the world. It was about the differences and similarities between people everywhere. The magazine was unique. It had no advertising. It didn't have to sell ads and therefore had no need to conform to any marketing manager's and one of the more notorious articles was a series of photos that illustrated the global views on racism. They did this by alternating the racial identity of very iconic figures. I'm sure you recognize this as a white Michael Jackson. They also did a Chinese Pope, the Queen of England as a Hispanic, and Arnold Schwarzenegger as black. The idea was if you could separate the person from the race, then you could figure out just how you feel about the race as a person. While the magazine and similar advertising certainly raised the profile of the clothing manufacturer Benetton, it generated miles of worldwide publicity, but you can't help but wonder some weren't left with a bad taste in their mouth. You know, what has all this got to do with selling cotton sweaters? There is a great book in our Marriott Library and all of the work of Tuber Common. The book itself was designed by Michael Beirut. The use of vernacular can be taken to the maximum in the work of art Chantry, Art Chantry, C-H-A-N-T-R-Y. This is a sales flyer for 
for the clothing retailer Urban Outfitters in the fall of 1994. Art Chantry writes all of the silly copy as well as designing it. Here's another one Chantry did for the Center on Contemporary Art. I remember doing a piece for our own Utah Advertising Federation that similarly was based on an ad in Popular Mechanics magazine. Of course, the Ad Federation was a much more willing audience. Might be tough to pull this off for a corporate client. Not a vernacular designer, but perhaps more of a retro influence because of his interest in Russian constructivism. In fact, Rodchenko in particular is the London-based designer Neville Brody. Neville Brody. Known for his design work for British magazines and rock music album covers. The type that Brody used was primarily hand-lettered, not typeset from any available fonts, and done without the aid of a computer. Because this is uh, 1985, Postscript was not yet available. Neville Brody came to prominence with his work for The Face magazine. Note to have a headline bled on the opening M from this article was actually taken from the previous issue and turned upside down. It was a W at that time. The unique thing is it took a little time and a bit of a photo and headline with it when it was moved as well. I read the other day that every decade we need an editorial designer to shake things up. Brody was probably that individual for the 80s, and David Carson, who we'll talk about next week, for the 90s. Look how Brody here is decompressing the headline logo from the contents page in successive issues, attempting to highlight the recognition versus the readability of the word over a period of five different issues. There's a very decorative shopping bag created by Neville Brody, Neville Brody, excuse me, for Bloomingdale's in 1988. Really represents the last phase of Brody's hand-drawn designs because this was all done with repetograph ink, pen, and white paint printed in two colors on this recycled paper. This is Randall Smith, and you're listening to my lecture on the Global Dialogue, prepared for my Designer 2600 class, The History of Graphic Design at the University of Utah, Spring 2020. The lecture is based broadly on Chapter 23, The Global Dialogue from the book Meg's History of Graphic Design by Philip Meggs and Alston Purvis. It's no surprise to learn that the world has entered the age of global dialogue, just as events around the world affect us. Our health, which is particularly noticeable the last few weeks, stock market, our gas tank. So likewise is design influenced by an international culture. Contributing to this global village that we live in is the technologies of the internet, social media, and the easy access to graphic design process. 
So this is kind of a short chapter. We're going to look at work from the United Kingdom, Japan, and the Netherlands. England sits between the formality of the Swiss style on the continent on one side and the more graphically expressionistic styles of the United States on the other. The design partnership known as Pentagram was a center of post-war British design. Started by five partners, we're going to talk today about Alan Fletcher and Colin Forbes, two of those original five. This is a photograph of the package that Pentagram sent to Graphis Magazine, who were publishing an article on the firm's design work. The record of the parcel's international journey to the magazine also became the cover that carried Graphis Magazine to its readers. There's a poster, a bus poster for Pirelli slippers designed by Alan Fletcher, one of the original five partners in 1965. It's a very creative solution to using the passengers as part of the design solution, unknowingly perhaps. I do remember seeing a UTA bus for a local car dealer that used that very same concept. This is the other partner we're going to mention, Colin Forbes, who has designed a symbol for a die-casting conference, the Zinc Development Association, in 1966. He kind of took advantage of the, the year of the conference to create a logo for a, for a die-casting conference using both the male and female components of a die-casting mold. We've all signed petitions before. This one has two dozen very famous signatures, making it a memorable poster for a campaign against museum charges created by Colin Forbes in 1970. It was Forbes who moves to the United States and opens a New York office. He's now retired. Colin Forbes did serve as the president of the AIGA, the National Association. He also visited Salt Lake City once, and I heard Forbes explain the unusual organization of Pentagram while we were all having dinner at Market Street Grill. It's not run like a typical company. It's a real distributed management style. The partners are invited to join the company only after they've established a reputation on their own. Each partner has just a small group that works with the partner as a team. There is no top-down management, no pyramid hierarchy. Each team is accountable and expected to be profitable on its own. Although they have different offices around the world, each office is independent but they do share in some marketing and promotion expenses. Pentagram has grown a lot since its founding with five partners. All five of the original have now retired. This is a 1990 photo shot in France at one of their annual get-togethers. At this time, it had 16 partners and about 130 employees. Currently, Pentagram has 25 partners, but it's changed a lot since the time of this photo. Now it has offices in the original London, in New York, which was established in 78, Austin, Texas in 94, and Berlin in 2002. It did have an office for a long time in San Francisco, uh, which Kit Heinrichs uh, Manage, and that, in fact, is he in the forefront of this particular photo, but he has since retired. Pentagram continues its revolving partnerships as older designers retire. It is the largest independently owned design firm and the only major design studio where the 
owners of the business are the creators of the work and serve as the primary contact for their clients. In 1989, Pentagram was hired to give a completely new look to what had been a very backward-looking classical British newspaper called The Guardian. The publisher said he wanted something that was more continental-looking. Newspaper design is, in fact, very traditional. Competitors thought The Guardian was entering into, quote, an enormous folly, unquote. But in fact, The Guardian is still recognized as the most distinctive daily paper with a typographic sensitivity that was way ahead of its time. They used heavy sans-serif type, together with serifed text type and extensive use of bars and rules that divided and organized it. I saw a tweet by Jessica Halfen just uh, a few years ago that commented on another redesign of the Guardian magazine. She called it at the time breathtakingly visual, serious, and newsworthy. I am in awe of this. This particular project was on display in our own library a few years ago. It's the uh, It was the AIJ 50 Books, 50 Covers uh, show that was uh, being exhibited uh, on the fourth floor. The British publisher Canongate broke the Bible down into its pocket-sized or bite-sized pocket books. It had introductions by contemporary authors along with gritty photographic illustrations of everything from nuclear explosions to long and winding roads in one case for the book of Revelations, and the other case for the book of Exodus. They packaged all these little pocketbooks in a slipcase. Angus Highland, a partner at the London office, spread from Graphique magazine in 2009, illustrating a series of essays on typographic form. And some postage stamps designed by David Hillman, also from the London office in 1999. David Hillman has since retired. Pentagram is multidisciplinary. Quote, we design everything from architecture, interiors, products, identities, publications, posters, books, exhibitions, websites, and digital installations. This is Alan Fletcher's work from the original London office. With so many different partners, the group does not have a unified style or philosophy. They just approach projects with intelligence and appropriateness. We'll come back to Pentagram in the last chapter. Of course, there are other British designers besides Pentagram doing interesting things. This is the cover to a book about a design firm with the same name, Why Not Associates. Very experimental London group multidisciplinary. They've worked with everyone from Nike to Kobe Fashion Museum. We do have this book in the Marriott Library. Very, very interesting read. So after World War II, mm -hmm. Japan really assimilated much of the Western lifestyle. And in the process, turned into a very mighty industrial force. Traditional Japanese design, like these crests, are simple, symmetrical, very refined. Philosophically, Japanese graphic designers attempted to retain 
some of their national traditions while incorporating Western influences. And you can see that in the symmetry of Japanese graphic design. In this case, the work of Yasuko Kamakura. He was appointed uh, director of the Tokyo Olympics in 1964. He started out as an architect, but then worked in editorial design until 1948 and really emerged as a design leader in post-war Japan. So Kamakura did the logo and poster for this 1964 Olympics held in Tokyo and helped establish Japan as a center of design activity. Kamakura was a leader simply through the vitality and strength of the work that he did. This is a poster for an exhibition of light fixtures, 1972. The basis for this new Japanese design movement was really European constructivism. This is a poster of Kamkuras for UCLA in 1981. It's tempered by Japanese intuition and heritage. It's got a lot of simplified emblematic form and can be seen in this particular poster. It's symmetrical balanced, unlike a lot of modernist design, which tend to be more asymmetrical. Cam Kerr's poster for a lighting design competition in 83. It's interesting as you look at these little spiked linear patterns, they diffuse as you look at it from a distance and almost appear like a halo. Here's another Japanese designer with Bauhaus-like grid structures and uh, interesting planes of color in this particular poster, 1981. His name is Tam Tamaka, Iko Tamaka. He explores a lot of modern design principles while maintaining traditional Japanese elements. Tanaka again, poster for a fashion designer in 1973. Almost a, a new wave sensibility to this high fashion butterfly. Takanobu Igarashi got a BA in Japan, but received his master's in the UCLA. His design work really blends those two experiences. Has a strong interest in working with alphabets in isometric perspective and applies that idea to graphic, product, and environmental design. Igarashi is partway through a 10 year project to design this calendar each month with a different design theme, and each day with a totally unique drawing. In total, some 6,226 numbers will need to be created. Admirable tenacity. Here's a carrier bag for the Museum of Modern Art created by Igarashi in 1985. It's a monochromatic pattern of very cool corporate appeal for the Museum of Modern Art. Grafis, the design publisher, has just put out a new book on Igarashi's work, The Creative Journey of a Japanese Master. But not all Japanese designers are based in that order and logic of the international style. 
miles apart from the work of Igarashi and is the work of Tadanori Yoku. Yoku. This is a poster of his, 1965. A lot of influence of Dada, pop art, like comic books. I bought a t-shirt that was very much uh, the style of Yoku. Yoku likes to introduce photographic elements, fascination with mass media, popular art, and comic books. Yoku expresses the passion and curiosity of the Jap Japanese generation that grew up with American mass popular culture and electronic media. And just one slide of a kind of playful attitude in the work of a Japanese designer named Shigo Fuku Fuguta, F-U-K-U-D, F-U-K-U-D-A. Simple line art conveys the message. Jumping across the continent to the Netherlands, look at just one or two of each of a handful of Dutch designers. Of course, we have the strong heritage in the Netherlands of the Distill Movement, Piet Zwart. That reasserted itself after the disruption caused by World War II and the German occupation. An individual named Wim Crowell, C-R-O-U-W-E-L, set up a multidisciplinary firm in Amsterdam, began to attract work from outside the country, called it Total Design, formed in 63 with a product designer, an architect, and a graphic designer. Crowell was the graphic designer. He passed away just last year in 2019. Total Design promoted the ability to provide a total image to their clients with integrated graphics, architecture, and product. Wim Kroll practiced the Swiss style, very methodical, very evident in his design work. Absolute simplicity gains expression simply through color. These are some postage stamps, 1976. Of course, the international style is closely associated with the grid, and it has a real sanctified status um, as probably the most important invention of the age, and the grid certainly preceded the Swiss style of the 40s and the 50s. You find grids in things like financial matters and invoices and ledgers. Yet once the grid was introduced as a panacea for graphic design clarity rather than just an organizational tool, the grid has become the target of both love and hate. Loved for bringing order to disorder, but hated for locking designers into rigid conf confinement. The truth really lies somewhere between those two extremes. Joseph Mueller Brockman is the author of this book, and he said, the grid system is an aid, not a guarantee. It permits a number of possible uses, and each designer can look for a solution appropriate to his personal style but one must learn how to use the grid. It is an art that requires practice. The design of currency is kind of a nation's archetype, has deep meaning and resonance. 
the basic format is really pretty simple. Currency is just a printed piece of paper, typically a rectangle. And outside of technical efforts to make it hard to counterfeit, there's really nothing but the designer's imagination to work with it and probably an infinite range of possibilities. Before the Euro, Holland went out of its way to to make banknotes that floated all the usual traits of typical currency design. Flaming yellow sunflower that fills one entire side. These banknotes were designed by RDE Oxnar for the Dutch currency and addressed all of the real concerns that the U.S. worries about, like counterfeiting, ease of use, production requirements. Banknotes are also an attempt to evoke something about the national identity. This is the Swiss currency, who uses the architect Le Corbusier. The Swiss have turned their notes on their sides, vertical instead of horizontal. Modernity is usually expressed by disrupting the conventions of banknote design. This can be used to serve as a signal of the cultural values of the, the bankers and the leaders who sometimes put their names on the notes. This is the euro currently used throughout continental Europe. This is the British banknote, who even before Brexit did not use the euro. My current pet peeve is the design of American currency. It seems to me to be a rather strange integration of traditional forms with a contemporary sans serif in one corner. Formerly, it was more traditional and more symmetrical in layout and more consistent with serif type. It seems like these new lay layouts are kind of awkward with their sans serif type mixed with decorative serif type and it's neither symmetrical nor asymmetrical. This is the back of the one dollar. I think the back is a little bit better designed than the front. It really hasn't changed uh, very much. The main job of a banknote is to convince us of its worth, suggesting that it's much more than the paper on which it's printed. U.S. currency has the advantage of some very potent iconography. On the back you've got the all-seeing eye and the pyramid. It looks valuable because it looks complicated with those billowing typographic swirls. It looks so precise and difficult to draw. It almost looks like it was the product of some kind of a divine revelation or a Masonic ritual. Back to the ne Netherlands, that is before we got sidetracked about their currency, one slide of Anthony Beeke, B-E-E-K-E, who brought rather unconventional solutions to Dutch design, sometimes with erotic overtones. The Dutch designer Gert Dunbar formed a studio Dunbar in 1977. And Gert Dunbar developed a technique of staged photography whose elements are arranged in an environment, often with paper mache figures included. In the Netherlands, government agencies have their own visual identity system or house style and 
Kurt Dunbar at Studio Dunbar created this house style manual for the PTT, which is the Netherlands Postal and Telecommunication Service, in 1989. The PTT has a long history of pushing for aesthetic excellence from postage stamps to post office buildings. So this is the corporate identity manual for PTT designed by Studio Dunbar. This is another house style manual for the Motoring Association 1985. It really has the look of mid 80s design also by Studio Dunbar. Hard Workin', W-E-R-K-E-N. Hard Workin' is a, a small, loosely collaborative group that started with a monthly publication in Rotterdam, 1978. The magazine began out of a wish to produce something without client demands, and it was about their own city, Rotterdam. It had kind of an anything-goes approach. The popularity of the publication even spawned a loose collaborative design group by the same name. They eventually set up a branch in Los Angeles doing work for Warner Brothers, Esprit. This is a souvenir stamp for the PTT 1988. Experimental Jet Set is the name of an Amsterdam-based graphic design firm founded by three partners in 1977. And they're the ones that did the promotional work for the motion picture Helvetica. Came out seven or eight years ago. And I presume you've all seen the movie Helvetica. You certainly should if you haven't. It's a it was certainly appropriate that Experimental Jet Set designed the promotional work for the movie because almost everything they design is in Helvetica. They were clearly inspired by the Dutch modernists, including Wim Crowell, who we just talked about. They claim to blend Dutch modernism with post-punk. They are in the Helvetica movie, along with Wim Crowell and many, many others, Massimo Vignelli, Paula Scheer, Herman Zapf, Michael Beirut. So if you haven't seen it, you, you need to. In the digital age we live in, there has been a backlash against the overtly digital design, preferring more handmade, painter-like compositions that are more like fine art. Our author categorizes these and those that follow as the new conceptual poster. Gitti Koth, K-A-T-H, is a Danish artist who practices in this fashion. The design was selected for the official Paralympics poster of the Danish Sports Organization for the Disabled. Another poster by Kathy K-A-T-H for a play titled Story of the Abandoned Doll. An Austrian that you've probably heard of, who works in New York City, Stefan Sagermeister. He's among the most highly regarded designers working today. Sagermeister often uses his own handwriting instead of typesetting. He said, handwriting avoids the kind of choice that would fix the work too firmly in a particular design genre. Handwriting is more direct and immediate 
without giving through the stylistic contortions of choosing and arranging your type choices. One of the most notorious pieces that Saugmeister has ever done, perhaps anyone's ever done, was a poster for his lecture at the Detroit AIGA chapter. The text is carved into his, his own body. He intended to cut the copy himself, but as he said, part of the problem was cutting in reverse, part of the problem was cutting accurately, and part of the problem was cutting. It took about eight hours, his body becoming literally a piece of graphic design. Focused on himself, made out of himself in a way that steps outside the constraints of any really recognizable genre. An amazing commitment to his struggle for self-expression. A Swiss designer who has lived and worked in LA from time to time and even collaborated with Saul Bass at one time is Paul Brotweller, now living and teaching in Luzerne, Switzerland. Another poster of his for the Luzerne Theater, 1998. Here's the guy we mentioned, I believe, on the very first day of class, Chip Kidd. He's the author of Cheese Monkeys, that novel about graphic design students. He's a designer for book covers, book jackets. In this case, we've got two covers in one. This design reveals the shorts before the dust jacket is removed. And this design reveals an x-ray after the dust jacket is removed. Chip Kidd works for the New York publisher Alfred A. Knopf. He said, I never really know if the reader gets the subtle visual puns of my jackets, but I can't let that inform my design to the point where I will compromise. 1998 book cover for the turn of the century, using a mirror image to depict the subject of this novel. It's about the media-driven world of New York and Los Angeles. In fact, here's the book that we mentioned on that first day of class, which I now have a signed copy of, thanks to my previous teaching assistant, David Haben. David had mentioned to Chip Kid that I had talked about him in my class, and as a result, Kid sent me his book signed. Chip Kid says a good working knowledge of the history of design is a really important thing. Some schools emphasize it, and some do not, but it only gets more important as the history of design progresses. Chip Kidd is a Batman fanatic and has designed a number of Batman books. He, in fact, wrote this one as well as designed it. But I noted recently that the reviewers on Amazon gave it higher marks for the art and design than the story itself. Chip Kidd has a bunch of videos you can find on YouTube or on his website, including a couple of TED Talks. And Chip Kidd spoke at Salt Lake City Design Week just two years ago. In fact, I had the opportunity to pick him up at the hotel and drive him to the Adobe Building in Lehigh where his speaking engagement took place. Moving now to a few representative images from different parts of the world. First to Spain where graphic design is a relatively newer discipline, Manuel Estrada, a designer who initially 
studied in architecture. Opened a design studio in 1989. Used some book covers for a series of books. 2004. Estrada also does, directs a master's design program in Madrid. Here's another series of book covers. And moving to China, now Dean of the School of Design at Central Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing is Min Wang. Min Wang had studied at Yale under Paul Rand before joining Adobe Systems, where he created this font catalog cover in 1990. Min Wang later returned to China, where he now practices design with a very strong cross-cultural understanding. And we're going to end up tonight in South Korea with the work of Kim Jun Park, who, with a master's degree in advertising, worked for public relations and advertising agencies before starting his own design studio. He won a lot of design awards, and his work is prominent in collections of major museums. This is a calendar he created. His designs really blur the border between typography and painting. Thank you previous advertising page, a technique that we'll see again in the work of David Carson when we talk about him next week. And part of this same subcategory as retro. Vernacular design is the use of commonplace forms from another time. And this idea can apply to any medium this is the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, Tennessee, who have really adopted a vernacular ideology here in their use of the original motel sign, the Lorraine Motel, which is being used to do, identify their museum. This is the museum that's located in the renovated motel where Martin Luther King was killed. previous image were from a brochure for this service, a uh, digital typesetting service. Typogram was the name of the company. But with desktop publishing, typefaces could be contorted, distorted, and dimension imposed on what were otherwise flat surfaces. All these capabilities, however, did not necessarily produce positive results, but you were at least capable of doing those kinds of things.